Rebecca's work involves survivors of sex trafficking in the Philippines. We're not going to be discussing graphic details, but we did want to flag this for those of you here with us in Singapore, as well as those watching virtually, as we know this can be a very triggering topic. So Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit more about the mission of May's Own and how you got started on this endeavor? Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, so Maison is a social enterprise and we provide livelihood programming and education opportunities for underprivileged children in the Philippines uh, and more recently in Singapore as well. Uh, we work with weavers in the different provinces. We try and get them access to new markets in Singapore um, and then we use whatever we earn from that business to buy laptops and connect underprivileged children to education opportunities, whether that's online learning, connecting them with online learning platforms because there's a lack of teachers in the area. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just trying to do our best and make sure that, you know, they can continue what they're trying to do. Absolutely. And can you tell us a little bit more about the artisan piece of it? And, and you know, you almost have an, an e-commerce operation going yeah. on, I hear. So, uh, well, in Southeast Asia, you know, we have a lot of different handicrafts. Um, and I really wanted to try and preserve that heritage. A lot of our artisans are elderly or single mothers. Um, our oldest artisans are around 80 years old now. Oh. Um, and our youngest is 16. But it's very difficult for them to go into urban areas and get like a call center job, for example, which is, you know, available in the Philippines. But uh, I feel like I wanted to try and preserve that heritage. I mean, these looms that they use to weave with, they're over 100 years old and um, they don't they're not very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. So this way, you know, we can try and preserve that craft and present it in a more modern way. Um, and use e-commerce to kind of share that with our community here in Singapore. Fantastic. So your family founded the traditional Chinese medicine company, Yu Yang Sung. Yes. And I'm curious how being part of this entrepreneurial legacy has shaped your approach to social impact work. Um, actually, our family business started as a social enterprise as well. It was uh, set up to give the tin mine workers health care because at the time there was none. At the time, a lot of them were addicted to opium. So mm -hmm. it in itself was a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the concept of philanthropy, of giving back to the community and getting involved has been in my family for so long. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of rubbed off on me. Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore has changed in that time. And you know, we're very blessed that you know, I get to go to school. I get to walk home safe. Mm -hmm. Singapore is a first world country. Um, and it's very beautiful and I love my country. Uh, so I felt that my efforts would be best served somewhere else in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, um, where opportunities that I have might not be available to the people there. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the trip that you took to the Philippines that kind of started it all? And, and what about that kind of got your mind thinking, hey, I can do something here? Well, it was kind of, by accident, I was in Australia studying international relations. And like most of my uh, college peers, we just wanted to go to Southeast Asia for the summer. You know, some of them went to Bali, teach English for the summer. Um, and my trip just ended up being a lot longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought I would try and um, volunteer because I felt that uh, when I was in college, you know, we were looking at the data about sex trafficking in Southeast Asia and I just felt like, I didn't quite believe it. I guess being in Singapore, I wasn't exposed to that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I, I went and, and it was And good. here we are. Yeah, and here we are. <laughs> and it just became like a really long journey. Yeah. Uh, eight years. <laughs> Great. So we're joined here today by an audience of corporate and investment leaders who may be looking to bolster their work uh, around the S in ESG. Um, so I'm curious, what advice would you have for them um, on embarking on a social impact project? And how do you think that they can best leverage their resources, whether it be financial, manpower, et cetera, and influence to actually make change in these projects? So I wanted to, I guess uh, with this summit, everyone here already has an intention of doing that, which is great. Um, something that Anderson spoke about earlier was to have a more long-term plan, which is to be more intentional with what you're trying to do. If you want to make a social impact, environmental impact, I really just 
ask you to be intentional and sincere with that effort. Um, don't just put the word sustainability on it. You know, uh, there are tools available. There's B Corp now. You can build a framework about what sustainability means to you because the beautiful thing about sustainability is that no one really knows what it means anymore, you know? Um, and if you're just going to use it as a marketing term, um, people will see through that. I mean, I work in social media as well, and I think the younger generation is very, very quick to call out people who make claims that may not be true. Um, so if you have that goal, you know, as a company, as someone in the position of power, whether, you know, you're running um, a multi-million dollar, billion dollar business, uh, or simply someone working there who maybe has access to some disposable income that you're willing to part with, think about what you want to do with these resources and how you want to make a difference. Right. So, you know, as we're sort of talking about you know, the, the concept of greenwashing or, you know, just these activities being more marketing than actual results driven. I am curious how you approach this because you had shared with me when we initially spoke that the majority of survivors that you work with, you know, unfortunately end up back in sex work. Um, I think that this just really speaks to how challenging your work is. Um, and that social impact is a little bit, um, you know, harder to, to make progress in. It's not just, you know, controlling what your company does. It's, you know, working with real people. So how do you measure success? And as a kind of a follow-up onto that, companies that are looking to, you know, do this kind of work, there's a lot of increased pressure on everyone to have ESG reporting data and metrics available. So how do you think that they should approach this, given that it is sort of a, a long, long haul? It's a long haul, yeah. I think, um, well, I recently started to know B Corp, uh, B Corp set up in Singapore. If you haven't heard of it, I think it's like a, a really good starting point because you have to fill out kind of a checklist um, and try and understand what your constitution as a business does. And that kind of gives you a working framework to to, to really uh, aim for. Um, again, like there isn't a set path. When I started this, I just wanted to teach English for the summer. I didn't plan to do this <laughs> for so long. Um, for me, you know, I didn't want to just write a check and leave. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like watching a horror movie. You either get up from your seat and you leave the cinema or you wait until the whole thing is over mm -hmm. and you see some kind of result, right? The mm -hmm. hero wins or the ghost gets exercised. I don't know. But um, for me, it was really trying to understand what the needs were and that most of the time, you know, when we talk about survivors of sex trafficking, I don't think people realize, yes, maybe we rescued, um, let's say, like 20 girls, right, from, from a site, but out of those 20 girls, maybe 17, 18 of them will eventually return to, to sex work. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's the only community that they've known. These are the only friends that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not concerned about, oh, what are the psychological effects of this trauma? They're worried about what am I eating mm -hmm. tonight? Um, the needs are very different. And to understand that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It helps. It, I, I needed to I needed time to build my intention and what I was trying to do. So the way that I measure success now is um, the number of people that want that help mm -hmm. and can I get to them? What can mm -hmm. I provide for them? Um, since COVID started, I had to move back to Singapore and I haven't been in the Philippines, but we focused on providing online education and now we have over 400 students. Um, and I'm very proud of that number. It's probably not a very big number. I'm sure many people here have companies that have a lot of employees, but I'm proud of that number because um, I just didn't think that we would ever get there. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Thank it's you. It's a lot of work. And, and you know, speaking of this, you, know, we were, you had to come back to Singapore. So who, who are the partners that you're working with on the ground? Um, you know, obviously there's, you don't drop a check and run, but you know, no. I think being, it sounds like being t part of the local community and being really tapped into what's going on there is a huge piece of success here. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, who are your go-tos on the ground? Well, I think in social enterprise, we work quite collaboratively. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just me that's providing 
um, help. It's also the online learning platforms that are saying, okay, let's provide some support. Mm -hmm. um, I work collaboratively with the foundations and the shelters. So I approach them, I say, hey, you know, can I focus on your education needs? What does it look like? What, what, what can I provide? Do you need mm -hmm. printers? Do you need laptops? Right. Um, and uh, I work with other businesses in the Philippines as well. Mm -hmm. um, in Singapore, I work with uh, children on the autism spectrum. And so, you know, I'm trying to leverage my network here to maybe get uh, more funding for livelihood programming for the students here. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just really trying to figure out what can I do with my network? How can we work together? Um, this is very important. You know, it doesn't, I don't need like 50 people working for me because actually it's more of a logistics right. kind of issue. Mm -hmm. How do we get the laptops there? So I work with an electronics company that is very involved. You know, they know that I've spent six years in the Philippines learning Tagalog and working on the ground mm -hmm. and they believe in me. So they also provide the support. All right, so you've kind of built that trust yeah, up. It's, which it's working with different success. parties. Yeah. yeah. Can you share an example of a corporate partnership that has gone right for you? Um, and, and just give a little bit more, more background on what were the keys to a successful collaboration? What are you looking for in a partner that you're working with? Um, working in the Philippines is difficult and it's very dangerous. So the electronics company that I work with, it's called Pound It. And uh, they actually, they're very intuitive. They know that um, they have to kind of protect the stock, you know, and, and they'll make sure that the routes that they take are safe. They make mm -hmm. sure that the drivers that they use for the delivery will be trusted with the location of these shelters that are protecting survivors of sex trafficking. You know, mm -hmm. it's just having an understanding community that cares about each other. Um, rather than looking at it as a, okay, this is a corporate partnership. What is the transaction? Right. You know, uh, how much can we get out of this deal? Mm -hmm. uh, they're very understanding. Mm -hmm. They will fight for the best deal for me. They'll tell me maybe go with an older model um, if you don't need that much processing power mm -hmm. because they know that I'm not an IT specialist. Um, and they're really looking out for the needs of my beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So they're on my side. Yeah. Again, like getting to know somebody, it's like dating, <laughs> getting to know somebody, going out with them. Right. It takes time to get to know if this is gonna work or not. And that's exactly how my partnerships work. I mean, again, like, it's been a really long time. It's been six years. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a shared mission is really the key to all of this. I wanna pivot a little bit to the role of social media in your life and your work. Um, because I think um, <laughs> today I'm wearing right Maxamara. Yeah. I know, um, <laughs> but I think you know. But you do have a really large network, um, you know, not just socially, but also on social media, and it's sort of opening up um, a new platform, a new audience to some of these issues that they may not have known about, and you can really shine a lens on that. So, how do you how do you think about you know your your role as an influencer in the social impact work that you do? I think that for young people, they really, uh, there was a poll recently where these primary, primary school students were asked like, oh, what is your dream career? And like something like 80% of them said is social media influencer. Wow. So they really, really idolize uh, social media influencers mm -hmm. and content creators. Um, and I know that that's very negative connotation because you know, they're mostly seen as pretty vapid individuals who love to take selfies. Mm -hmm. So why don't we use this to our advantage? If there are, um, if there are brands out there, beauty brands, fashion brands, uh, lifestyle brands who are willing to put up the money to use my face to sell their products, what are they willing to give me to talk about on their platform? So can I use my platform for good? Um, I think that the media in Singapore I've been interacting with since I was a kid. I mean, I started as like a socialite, essentially. Mm -hmm. So transitioning into social media was quite natural for me. But I went in with the idea that if I'm going to part with my private life and I have to tell people um, about, oh, the hotel that I'm staying in and like what I'm wearing and who's my makeup artist and things like that, then can I make that work to my advantage? Can mm -hmm. I also inject my message? Can I get these young people who want to be social media stars or who follow you know, all of these different people, can I get them to listen to me? And actually, they've been very receptive. I think young people genuinely care about 
sustainability and the world around them. I am by no means, you know, a top social media influencer, but I've done my best and the reception has been quite welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, I think both sides, like businesses and the audience, um, have the same goal of helping. And when I tell them about uh, the beneficiaries that I have, they're obviously quite receptive. You know, they want to help. They're like, oh, how can we get involved? Um, we've done so many different funding projects and they've all been quite well received. So in that sense, I'm quite hopeful for the next gen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We could have gone on for a couple hours here, I think. Yeah. But um, thank you for joining us, and we will be watching the continued success of Maze Zone. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me.